I stand. to me David 
fought Goliath and he won. The humble shepherd boy became a king. The Lord was good and the Lord was strong and David lived his life for him. Daniel was inside a lion's den. Great. Do please take a seat. And remember that God is faithful to us, but so many times we are not faithful to him, his word, his promises. But come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Wonderful words, wonderful promises. We can come openly and honestly to God and confess our sins sincerely, fully. So we pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Psalm 32 begins, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Wonderful words of the Lord Jesus when he says to us, your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, just one item of church family news. Um, unless anybody's got anything else, just to remind you that uh, Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month, there will be the central prayer um, as usual, and that will be happening here in this building, in the church building, uh, starting at seven, it's just taking one hour, seven till eight, Wednesday evening, central prayer for anybody in the whole benefice to come together and join in prayer together. That's Wednesday evening, seven o'clock in here. So we pray our collect for today. 
Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church, open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, Alex will lead us in further prayer. For our prayers this morning, I thought we'd uh, follow the advice of the Apostle Paul to Timothy uh, when he gave him uh, some tips about how to pray in the church. So let us pray. Paul wrote, I urge then, first of all, the requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Father, we thank you for your great love for the whole world. Uh, we thank you that you love all people. We thank you that everyone on this planet is made in your image. Father, we thank you for the huge variety of people all over the world. Thank you for the variety of food, music, and dress. Thank you, Father, for the many gifts you have given to all people. We particularly thank you for the scientists who recently have developed these vaccines and saved many lives. Father, we thank you that uh, during these summer months you've had some great sport to watch. Thank you for the nations who have come together from all over the world. And thank you that uh, there are many Christians and chaplains and evangelists working among the athletes. Father, we thank you for all those who kept working during the pandemic so that we could live. Thank you for those in the health service, in the food industry, in logistics and delivery. Father, we could keep thanking you for a long time, but we also want to pray for our world. And so, Lord, we want to make our intercessions for all people. We intercede for the poor of our world. We thank you that all through the Bible, you ask us to care for the poor. Thank you that today the church is growing particularly amongst the poor of the world. We ask you to give us generous hearts so that we too uh, can be involved with what you're doing amongst the poor of our planet. We thank you for those who work amongst the poor. Thank you for Sue uh, Wingfield Digby, who works with Beesom, and uh, Diana Peters, who works for Christians Against Poverty. Thank you for all that they're doing in our area. And Father, we uh, want to pray for the uh, sick. Uh, Father, we thank you that when the Lord Jesus was here, he healed and cared for many sick people. Pray for the millions who have COVID at the moment around the world. We pray for all those who are caring for them. And we pray, Lord, that you will be at work in the lives of those who are ill at the moment with COVID. We pray that you will draw near to them and they will turn to you. We pray, Father, for the 87% of the world's population who have not been vaccinated. Uh, we pray especially for AstraZeneca down the road. Uh, we thank you that they've kept the vaccine at a cost price. And we pray that you'll help them to reach out to the billions who need it. And we pray, Father, for all of us that the lessons we've learned during the pandemic uh, will go with us, and we will be uh, more like Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Father, we want to pray for those who are sick that we know. Let's just be quiet and pray for those who are having treatment, about to have an operation, those who are recovering. And then Paul says, um, intercession should be made for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We pray, Lord, for the dictators of our world. Uh, we pray, Lord, that they may turn to you, may begin to fear you. Please take away their desire to dominate and intimidate and persecute. And we pray particularly for all Christians 
uh, that they may be able to live peaceful and quiet lives in all holiness in these oppressive regimes. We pray for all our democratically elected leaders. Please save them from loving power, save them from greed, save them from arrogance. Please may they promote peace in their countries, harmony and justice, so that all Christians can grow in godliness and holiness. The Apostle Paul writes, God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Father, we thank you so much that you gave your Son as a ransom for all people. We thank you that we have links with Christians all over the world who are wanting to bring the, the best message that this world has. And we pray for your Holy Spirit's power uh, to be upon these people, that they may be able to bring salvation. We think of Alex and Suzanne in Senegal, Erica and Sam Payne working amongst young people right around the UK, Tim Vickers with students across Europe, Mary and Wanyiki doing evangelism in Kenya, the Quetta Christian Hospital in Pakistan, Caitlin Ormiston working with students in New Zealand. Father, you want all people to be saved. And so we ask that you will use our friends we've just mentioned now to lead many to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And Father, you want all people to be saved in Burford and the villages around here. And so we ask you, you will help us as a church to witness well for Christ. Please forgive us for the mistakes we've made in our town. Help us to witness where we live, to witness where we work. And please, may we have your desire of wanting all people to be saved. We pray these things for your glory and your honour. Amen. Thank you, Alex. And we sum up all our prayers spoken and those prayers in our hearts in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word being read to us and preached upon, we stand to sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine! Year of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His. Of mercy, 
Our first reading this morning are the first nine verses of Leviticus. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without defect. He must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He is to slaughter the young bull before the Lord and then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and sprinkle it against the altar on all sides at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the burning wood that is on the altar. He is to wash the inner parts and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. And our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 9, and we start to read at verse 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, no part of the creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more? Then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, this morning, to, to start off, I've got a very special gift to show you. So I'm just going to go and get that gift now. Bear with me one second. Now, I, I know that some people are a little bit sad that uh, Lucy and I are leaving, so I thought I would be the first person in the world to clone myself. So I've made a five-inch clone of myself to leave with you. Uh, he's asleep at the moment. Let's just check he's there. There he is. Look at that. Isn't he a, a, an almost identical clone of me? Look. But I, you have to be very careful. I'm leaving him with you, uh, but you have to be really, really careful with him because he's so precious 
you know, to, have, to be the first person to clone somebody, a five-inch person themselves, very precious. So uh, you need to look after him. He's pretty unique. Uh, it has to be exactly the right temperature all the time. OK, everybody, you're getting this? No sudden movements, no jolting around. He needs a completely germ-free environment, so if ever you get him out, you need to make sure that you've uh, had a, a COVID test that's negative. Um, and also, he's very, very sensitive to uh, moral problems. So you need to make sure that you're thinking happy thoughts, that you've confessed all your sins and all that kind of thing when you uh, get him out of his little jar here. Uh, so I'm going to leave him now, Alex and Lynn. Do you mind just watching over him during the, during the sermon? Happy thoughts, though, remember, Alex. Happy thoughts. So I'll just pass him over. There you go. Be careful, don't you? Oh, oh careful. <laughs> careful. Look after him, please. Thank you. He's, st he's still sleeping soundly there. Um, very precious gift for you there, there to look after, little mini, uh, mini Oliver. Now, you, you may think, uh, well, you'll, you'll see what that has got to do with uh, what we're talking about in a moment. But we now have a wonderful month over August of looking at the book of Leviticus together. Now, just to fill you in on the background a little bit, Joseph was the last person we looked at, and he uh, brought his father and his brothers into the land of Egypt. Uh, they had lots and lots and lots and lots of children. Then the Pharaoh who was pals with Joseph died, and a new Pharaoh came along who didn't know Joseph, we're told. And he saw all these hundreds of thousands of Israelites, God's people, and he thought, what a wonderful source of slave labor. So Pharaoh enslaved the people of Israel. Then God raised up Moses to beg the Pharaoh to allow his people to go free. But the Pharaoh refused. And so God sent down plagues. And eventually, the people of Israel managed to escape through the parting of the Red Sea into the wilderness. God delivered the people. But in Exodus, God was very specific in why he wanted to bring the people out of Israel, of Egypt. rather. He brought Israel out not just so that they could be free, but he says again and again in Exodus... I'm bringing you out of slavery so that you may worship me in the desert. Their goal was to come out into the desert, not just to go, yay, we're free, but to worship God. And so the whole of the end of Exodus, the book of Exodus, which comes between Genesis, Joseph's story, and Leviticus that we're looking at this morning, the whole of the end of Exodus is dedicated to God giving instructions to Moses to build an enormous tent called the tabernacle a big portable temple which the people of Israel would take with them through the wilderness. And right at the end of Exodus, we're told that when the tabernacle is completed, all the tent built, then the glory of the Lord comes down to dwell with the people of Israel. Wonderful culmination of everything in the Bible that's happened so far. God has come to dwell with his people. He's given them the precious gift of himself. You're starting to see why I, I left myself with you. He's given them the precious gift, the most precious thing he could possibly give, which is himself. So three things we're going to look at uh, this morning as we look at Leviticus together. The one is thinking about the background to uh, this wonderful book. The second is to think about the purpose um, of this great book, and particularly of the offerings that we looked at just in the reading that Jim just read to us. And then we're going to be thinking about how relevant it is to us today. So let's pray as we look at this together. Lord, we thank you for your word, that it's pure and perfect, Lord, reviving our souls. We thank you that every bit of it is there for our edification and instruction. But Lord, we do confess when we read about cutting up bulls, Lord, and putting on them on altars, it is very foreign and alien to us. So Lord, please, by your spirit, show us this morning how it points to you and your holiness. Help us to understand how it points to the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on the cross. So we may be built up and instructed by it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So there was the tabernacle, this enormous tent. Um, and the, inside the tabernacle, it was holy. So only holy people could go in there. And inside the holy bit of the tabernacle, there was the most holy bit. And it's there that God's presence came to dwell. And it's hard for us to imagine, hard for us to get our heads around it, but that was actually the greatest gift God could give to his people was to give them his holy, precious presence. And I'd like to try and uh, think of you this morning, just for a few moments, about why it was so precious to have God dwelling in the midst of his people. Well, the first is that uh, God's presence was beautiful. Isn't that amazing, that God's presence with his people was beautiful? David writes in Psalm 27, it, when thinking about the tabernacle, David himself, the king of Israel, says, one thing I've asked of the Lord, this is all I want, 
to dwell in the tabernacle and to gaze upon the beauty of the presence of the Lord. King David, who'd conquered worlds, conquered lands, who had everything he could possibly want in those days, still wanted this one thing, to gaze on the beauty of the precious presence of the Lord God. So the presence of God was powerful. The presence of God was there to destroy Israel's enemies. It was incredibly powerful, so powerful that when God's presence was on Mount Sinai, he said to Moses, make sure that not even an animal touches the side of this mountain because my holiness will powerfully break out against you. The holiness of God was there to protect Israel from their enemies. The holiness of God was amazing. His presence was precious because he's the source of all goodness. Imagine having the one who created the world living in your presence, in your midst, amazingly precious. And I think one thing that is really incredible about the precious presence of God is that it was numinous. Do you know that word? It's numinous. Here's how C.S. Lewis described that word. He said, well, imagine you're in a room and I told you that uh, next door there was a tiger, right? That would be one kind of fear, okay? If I said, you're in a room and next door there's a ghost, that would be another kind of fear. But C.S. Lewis, trying to get to the bottom of what it meant for, to be numinous, said, well, imagine you were in a room and I told you that a great and powerful spirit was just the other side of the door. That's the feeling of numinosity, something so different something so powerful, but something good as well. I don't know if you've ever seen the film uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, it's quite a good film. I'd give it about six or seven out of ten. But uh, it does kind of quite nicely capture, I think, this feeling of numinosity because um, Richard Dreyfuss, who's the star, encounters aliens. But they're not the kind of little grey, big-headed things. They're these kind of amazing, light-filled spaceships but everybody who encounters them just wants to see them, wants more of this incredible, different, beautiful, powerful thing that they're encountering. That was the precious presence of God, different, beautiful, powerful. And people wanted more of it. Now, because God's presence in the tabernacle was so precious, the most precious thing that God can give anybody, there were lots of things that could spoil it. Just like there are lots of things that can spoil the little version of me there, there were lots of things that could spoil God's presence in the tabernacle. And I think that's anything opposite to what God is are the kind of things that could spoil his presence, his precious presence. So God is life. God is life. And so anything that symbolizes or represents death could spoil his presence in the tabernacle. God is pure. So anything that's not totally clean would spoil his presence in his people. God's totally morally good. So anything that's bad would spoil his presence. And that's not just anything bad in the tabernacle, it's anything in the whole community of Israel. The whole community had to be free of anything that represents death, free of anything that's unclean, free of anything that's morally impure. Now the start of Leviticus is all about offerings. And these offerings are there, if you like, to stop people spoiling God's precious and holy presence. That precious presence that it's hard to get our head around. I mean, some of us will have experienced God's presence in our lives and know just the tip of how precious and wonderful it is to have God present in your life. So the start of Leviticus is about offerings. The word literally means things you bring near. And they were there to help people avoid spoiling the precious presence of God. If any spoiling happened, they were to bring offerings, bring things close to the holy presence of God in the temple. Now, if you read the, the first few chapters of Leviticus, you'll see there are different kinds of offering. There's a burnt offering, sin offering, fellowship offering, peace offering. We're not going to go into detail about what the different offerings do, but I think a general purpose of them all is maintaining God's holy presence and not spoiling it. So verse 4 in our reading is a crucial verse, if you look at it with me on the sheet, because God says, you are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. So the point of this offering is to gain acceptance with this holy God and make atonement. Wonderful word made up by William Tyndale when he translated this um, into, into, out of Hebrew into English for the first time. at one -ment, being at one again with God. And the original word in the Hebrew is kippur, as in Yom Kippur, atonement. And the word means to cover. So it's almost like God covers over the sin, gets a sheet, uh, and he just covers over. He says, I, I, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's not there anymore. Other people have said, maybe it's like God covers his eyes. I just, as far as your sin is concerned, I'm not, I'm not even seeing it anymore. I've forgotten about it. But justice had to be done. 
Justice had to be done because God's presence was so precious, any spoiling that happened of his amazing holy presence required a penalty to be paid. Now, I think if you can imagine a correlation with me, the more precious the thing is, the more serious it is to defile or to spoil its preciousness. Think about something that's really precious to you and think, what if somebody completely ruined that? You'd want um, justice to be done. So the most precious thing of God's uh, presence requires a severe penalty for spoiling it. Indeed, the penalty was death. For justice to be done, death had to happen. And so God, in his grace, realizing that people would often spoil his presence, gives this gracious offer of, well, you don't have to die, but an animal can die in your place, which is what we were just thinking about from our reading just now. So the person would bring forward this offering, this sacrifice. And it's not just any old thing. They couldn't just uh, bring along, you know, 50p and put it in the box. It had to be something really precious. To show the preciousness of God's presence, God says, well, you need to bring something precious to pay for what you've done. And so get something of the most precious thing out of your herd. A bull without blemish. In other words, that bull that you've been saving, that you're hoping is going to have lots of little children, that bull that's wonderfully bred to make sure that all the cows down the line are healthy and perfect, yep, that one, that you're going to have to sacrifice. Big thing to offer for a, a, a society like that that was dependent on well-bred animals. And not only that, but they then had to kill the animal themselves. Now, I think God instituted that to show the people the seriousness of what they've done. You can't just kind of boot the animal into the, into the uh, tabernacle, let the priest deal with it. It showed the seriousness of the sin that they'd committed, the seriousness of spoiling God's holiness. And then it was completely burnt up so that you couldn't sneak back in at night and take a few nice prime steaks off what was left so that all of it was there for God's use alone. And the amazing thing is this had to happen. This is the mind-blowing thing. This had to happen every time somebody sinned. When you read later in, in Leviticus, if anyone sins, they need to bring a sacrifice like this to the Lord. Unbelievable. Any one time they sin, this has to happen. So we've been thinking there about the purpose of Leviticus. It was there to make sure that God's holy presence would not be spoiled. And if it was, there would be some way in which the person in question could be spared from the punishment that would need to take place. This sacrifice, all the gore and the guts that seems so alien to us today, was there to propitiate God. There's a posh word to mean that God would then not look at their sin anymore. So what's the relevance of Leviticus to us today? Well, I can see not many of you came into church this morning with a bull ready to sacrifice, or even a chicken or any of the other things that you're allowed to sacrifice if you don't have a bull, a pigeon. Because, of course, we don't need to do this anymore. But it's worth taking a few moments to think about why we don't need to bring these sacrifices to God anymore. Because God is the same God. He's just as holy as he was back then. His presence now doesn't dwell in the tabernacle. It's not like at that end of church. His presence is in us. It's the same holy presence that was living in the tabernacle, living within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just as precious and it's just as serious when we stain that holiness by our sin. But that's why we had our reading from Hebrews today, to show us that Leviticus is not the final word on this. Hebrews says, it's a great book to read alongside Leviticus, Hebrews says that the tabernacle, this great tent that was built with God's presence at one end of it, that's not the final story. It was a signpost to a greater reality. It was a picture and a symbol of heaven itself, of God's holy presence in heaven. And the role of the high priest, we'll be thinking about more about the high priest and what he did. We'll think about that next week. But the role of the high priest was to come into the holy place, only he could do that, to offer atonement for the sins of the people. But Hebrews tells us that Jesus acted as the greatest high priest, in that he didn't come into the tabernacle, the tent. He went into the place the tabernacle symbolized, God's holy presence in heaven. And he didn't offer the blood of bulls and goats, but he said, look, Look, Father, at all the spoiling that's gone on of your holy presence, of our name. Every time this person sinned, you and I, every time they sinned, says Jesus, they deserve to die because they spoiled the presence of God. But Jesus says this, I will take upon myself that penalty. I will offer myself as the ultimate offering, the ultimate sacrifice. 
I will die in their place, says Jesus. I will pay the penalty for every single sin they've ever done and that they will ever do. Jesus says that about us. And Hebrews, in verse 12 of our reading, let's go back to that on our sheets. He, thus Jesus, did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, like we've just been reading about in Leviticus, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption. Jesus didn't have to go on again and again into God's presence. He didn't have to keep sacrificing himself. He's done one sacrifice once for all, and the redemption he secured for us is eternal. We don't have to worry about keeping sacrificing things because Jesus has done it once for all, for all sins, past, present, and future. And redemption, that eternal redemption, means Jesus is a ransom for us. We, because of our sins, we, because we've spoiled God's world, his presence with us, we deserve that penalty. We're, we're sitting on death row. And yet Jesus has said, no, they can come off death row and I'll sit there in their place. He's bought us back off death row. Amazing. The Levitical system was very physical. It was all to do with bodies and blood and burning. But it was all a symbol of a spiritual reality. Hebrews makes this really clear. It was all symbolic. And symbolic of the position of humans before a holy God. The preciousness of God's holiness and how we can interact with it. Now, these days, God's holy community is not one nation wandering through the wilderness. God's holy community is across the world, like we were just thinking about in Alex's prayers. We have people that we know and love working across the world with God's great community. Because of Jesus offering himself as the ultimate sacrifice for sin, there are many benefits that come to us. First of all, we can enter the spiritual tabernacle. It was... One thing would happen to you if you barged your way into the tabernacle, into the holiest of holies. Zap, that was it. That was the end of you. But now we can go into that place which the tabernacle symbolized, God's holy presence, boldly, says the book of Hebrews. Because we are beneficiaries of the final sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. His blood has paid the price for our sins so that they are all covered. So that when we came into God's presence, yes, we have all these sins, but it's like they're covered up. God doesn't look at them because of what Jesus has done for us. Also because of Jesus' final sacrifice, we can be sure that when God returns and creates a new heaven and earth, when there will be only holiness, no spoiling at all anymore, we can be sure that we will have a place there because we will bring no spoiling with us because Jesus has covered it all and we can enjoy God's holy presence unmitigated forevermore. Another benefit is that we can have a clean conscience. That's in verse 14, the last verse that Jim read from Hebrews. God's offering of Jesus and his blood shed on the cross cleanses our consciousness from acts that lead to death. In other words, we don't need to be weighed down if we trust in Jesus by guilty things that we've done in the past, fearing that God will bring them up again on the day of judgment. We don't need that guilty conscience anymore because we've passed all the things we've done wrong, all the ways we've spoiled the world around us, all the way we've spoiled God's presence, his precious presence with us. We can pass them all onto Jesus' shoulders. And he says, I've taken them for you so that you need not fear the day of judgment. Also, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we receive from God rather than offer to him. This is the wonder of being a Christian. It's that in those days, it was up to the, it was up to the worshiper in Levitical days to bring forward that offering. Woe betide you if you didn't. And yet, the, Jesus took the initiative for us and offered himself. All that we need to do is receive. We can often believe that religion is about what we can bring to God, the good things we can do for him. The good prayers we can say, coming to church every Sunday. But it's not about that. It's not about what we give God. Christianity is all about what God has given us. There's those wonderful words that Jesus says of himself. I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. We can't even begin to start being a good person and serving God until we've let him serve us and wash us clean of our sins by his sacrifice. So because of Jesus' blood on the sh shed on the cross, we don't need to fear spoiling God's holiness again. But let's get really, uh, let's think about some more implications of this. One is that it was very interesting that the, the worshippers had to put their hand on the head of the bull. Such a physical way of identifying with that animal before you then kill it. It's to say, I'm transferring my sin, the bad things I've done, onto this animal in a real physical way, having to touch the thing that you're about to sacrifice. Now, I think, as human beings, 
We do that once. Jesus offered himself once. So when we come to faith in him, we put our hand on his head, metaphorically speaking, and all our sin is transferred to Jesus the moment we believe in him. We don't have to keep coming back and doing that because that one sacrifice has cleansed us of all our sins. That's, if you like, salvific repentance, the turning away from the bad things, the putting our hands on Jesus, saying, Lord, take away all the things I've done for me. That grants us salvation. It's done once. That brings us into relationship with our Heavenly Father. But we do keep sinning, don't we? I know I do anyway. And so we do need to keep repenting of our sins, not to gain that sacrifice, the benefits of the sacrifice all over again, but because the relationship between us and our Father is spoiled again by what we've done wrong. So we need to say, sorry, Lord, and he will forgive us. He'll never chuck us out of his family. But I think Leviticus teaches us one very important thing. Remember that that bull had to be sacrificed for one sin. So it shows us the seriousness of sin, just for one sin. I know I've already sinned today several times. That's several bulls. I know that I will sin again today. That's more bulls. I can't go and sacrifice bulls again and again and again. But all that guts, all that blood, it showed us. It was to show the people this is what sin does. It's not, there's no such thing as a peccadillo, that little word that means, it's a Spanish word meaning a little sin. There's no such thing as a little sin. Nor is there a difference, uh, as some theological uh, systems believe, between venial and mortal sins. You may have come across that before. Venial means pardonable sins, and mortal sins that mean you, you die for it. No such thing. All sins are mortal. Every single sin deserves death, but all sins are pardonable. Every single sin can be forgiven because of the Lord Jesus. So the answer for us, I think, is not uh, to be spending too much time thinking about blood and guts, not too much time wringing our hands, but to spend time at the foot of the cross. Because when we look up at the suffering that Jesus took upon himself, I mean, think about that. That one bull had to be gutted for one sin. Jesus took upon himself the countless billions of sins of the whole world. Imagine how much he had to suffer for that. So we spend time and we say, look, Lord, how much you had to suffer for me. And yet we hear the words of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. It's done. I have paid the full price. You have no reason to fear anymore. And so we take the advice of the Puritans, which is good advice, and that is to make much of sin. We read Leviticus and we think sin is terrible. Spoiling God's holiness is a terrible, terrible thing. And yet we make much more of God's grace. That he died on the cross. His son, Lord Jesus, died for us. We make much of sin, but we make more of what Jesus did on the cross for us. So when we first look at Leviticus, it may, find, may seem very strange, very alien. A bit repulsive, all this blood and guts. But it's to show us the seriousness of sin. And it's to point forward to Jesus' ultimate sacrifice of himself on the cross for us. So that we may... Take serious when we spoil his presence, but never fear, because he paid the price for us. And so if we're Christians this morning, I uh, say, let's spend time this week at the foot of the cross. Let's spend time praying that the Lord would help us to think about the seriousness of sin, but the wonders of what he did for us on the cross. If you're listening to this and you think, actually, I'm not sure if I am a Christian, then now's the time to do that very thing, to put your hand on Jesus' head to say, I'm going to give everything I've done wrong to you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to let you pay the price for me, and I'm going to trust you for the rest of my life. So let's spend some time in prayer now. Lord, for those of us who know you, Lord Jesus, we are just bowled over once more at your grace, Lord, that you, for your people, offered a way that they should not need to die for their sin. But Lord, we thank you that an even greater sacrifice was made, that you, Lord Jesus, as our high priest, entered into the holy places and offered yourself once for all, a sacrifice of eternal redemption. So Lord, help us to get this the right way around. Help us to bewail our sin, but to never fear its consequences because you have paid the price. And Lord, perhaps there are some of us here who are not sure whether we ever have committed to you, Lord Jesus. So if that's you, just in your heart, Imagine the Lord Jesus holding his hands out to you and saying, come to me, you who are laden with sin. Let me take them away from you. Let me give you my joy and my peace. So if that's you, then just pray with me, Lord, I place my hand on you, Lord Jesus, and ask that you take away my wrongdoing, that you would be my sacrifice for sin, and that you would help me from now on to live for you and with you. 
And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And I'm going to ask Cedric to come up and announce our next hymn so I can have time to go and um, get my bass ready. Lord, we pray that uh, those words we've heard and the meditations of our hearts may be pleasing in your sight today and this week. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So our great song hymn to finish with, responding to those wonderful words in Leviticus and Hebrews, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Let's stand and sing.
Thanks to God the Father through him. So God our Father, we give you thanks for this time together and pray that you will bless and guide us in all we do in word and deed in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. <coughs>